Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming to the Park Forum and welcome. Our speaker today is Dr. Valeria de Poiva. Valeria studied log logical proofs by means of algebraic and categorical tools. Her PhD work at the University of Cambridge in England was in categorical models of linear logic. By uncovering a relationship between Girard's linear logic, which was then fairly incipient, and Gadell's celebrated uh, di dialectic interpretation, which was one of the most fundamental tools of proof theory, her work proved to help to publicize the virtues of linear logic amongst mathematicians. She carried on working at the computer laboratory at Cambridge on different projects ranging from interactive theorem proving through electrical semantics. In 1996, she became an assistant professor at the University of Birmingham, where she helped establish their school of computer science. In 1999, Valeria moved to California and after a visiting fellowship, started work here at Park on logistics of context for knowledge representation systems. We were very sad to say goodbye to Valeria last year when she went to join Cool, a startup company building new search engine. But she's back today to tell us all about her adventures there in the world of search land. So please help me welcome Dr. Valeria de Poirier. Thank you. Well, thank you, Craig. That was very kind of you. A lovely introduction. Let's see. Lovely introduction. And Thank you very much for the invitation too. It is a great pleasure to be back in Park. Um, as Craig was just saying, I, I left a year and three months ago or something like that, after almost nine years. So it's always kind of great fun to walk in the corridors and, and go to the library and, and see people that I, that I kind of used to see every day for such a long time. But uh, things kind of, change and, and people kind of, um, it's one of the things that PAC people are famous for. We, we like to innovate and, and we like to innovate sometimes in our own personal lives too. So I decided to move on to Cool. And, and you know, Cool is a startup, was launched almost, uh, almost to the day a year ago, because it was on the 28th of July, 2008. And, um, hence, you know, you have the usual problem of ex parkers coming to park, which is that you can't tell much about what you're, what you're doing, right? You know, there's all this business of IP, secret sources, trade secrets, and all this kind of stuff. So you have a little bit of a, a funny, funky line to, to walk. And to walk this funny line, I thought, ooh, I remember that I have a, I thought I was kind of going to tell you some stories. And my stories are going to be um, somewhat uh, modeled after uh, Alice in the Wonderland. So that's why I call it Adventures in Search Land. And if you've seen the poster that the guys at Lisa produced for me, it's rather pretty, you know, it's kind of got the, the very famous scene of at the end of Alice in the Wonderland when the cars are trying to attack her and the cars are soldiers and stuff. But if I had chosen my own picture, I think I would have chosen this one here because a bit like the one that Lisa chose, it shows Alice's bewilderment and surprise at the new world where she found, finds herself in. But this one shows that Alice can actually roll the hedgehogs into balls and, and use the flamingos as a croquet mallet. And I think I feel a bit more like on this situation. You know, it's just the beginning of the adventure. We're having a great time. And so, you know, that's kind of how I would go if I was doing it today. Now, you might say to yourself, I, I, mean, I mean, that's one of the nice things about an audience, in a park audience, is that people are very different. There are people who are kind of, kind of brought up in startups. There are people that come from university. Actually, in the middle of the summer, like we are now, we don't, normally don't get that many Stanford students, which is a bit of a shame, as we were discussing early on. But you know, people here have very different backgrounds in general. So I, I thought I was going to explain why, for me, going to a startup like Cool was such a, a change of, of pace and a change of, 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 of framework altogether. So I thought I was going to start by 
talk to you, talking to you a little bit about my personal background. Then I'm going to give you my take on what is a search engine and how they work. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about why I think this actually constitutes a different world, kind of, a very nonsensical search land world. Then I'm going to talk about cool and the adventures and the opportunities that we are kind of playing with right now. Um, so what about my personal background? So yours truly went, as uh, Craig was saying a minute ago, I did my PhD in pure mathematics in Cambridge, and that's a recent picture of the maths department, kind of celebrating, actually, this guy here, who is my supervisor, um, Stig's birthday. And I did work on category theory, which was the bit that Paul Craig was having a bit of trouble saying. But you know, mathematics is like that. There's lots of interesting names and interesting symbols. And in this case, I actually insist in kind of going over it a bit because this is Kurt Gödel, And this is the most famous logician of the 20th century. You know, for people who know him, he is on the same par as Einstein. Actually, they did lots of work together. And what, what he did, he did an awful lot of work in logic, which is what I actually did for my PhD work. But one of the things that, when he was working, wasn't so clear, was that the work on logic that he was doing actually connects very prettily with the work on category theory, which is a kind of algebra that people do in the math department nowadays, and it connects very nicely to, to work on semantics of computation that is on programming languages, mostly actually functional programming languages, but kind of extending to object-oriented and stuff like that. And as I was saying, this is something that not lots of people know about, but something that even fewer people know about is that the same sort of beautiful, deep, exciting theorem that connects this sort of worlds here actually connects meanings in natural language to algebra and to logic. And that's how I actually end up in Park, working on the project bridge, kind of brought by Ron, who's sitting here, and kind of, because he actually believes in this very deep theorems. And working in Park on, on natural language and, and knowledge representation, we kind of end up, I, I do not know how much you guys know about that, but Park, um, Parks technology, that's a very old and mature technology, but extremely exciting right now, kind of uh, went to be the underpinnings in, of, of PowerSet, um, another search engine that kind of decided to use some of these ideas on semantics and meaning um, uh, to, to help with search, to help with your online shopping. And Kind of when people started talking about power set, I realized that actually search is an interesting problem. It's not, not only about your online shopping experience. There's kind of quite a few bits that one can think about when it comes to search. And then I decided that actually, instead of joining some of my friends, in particular the husband who had gone to power set, I was going to try a different tackle on the problem of search. And that's how I ended up there, in cool. Now, as it might have become clear from this kind of very short to the force over the kinds of things that I like doing, uh, until last year I did not know much about search. So my understanding of, of search was a bit like my understanding of cars, still is. You know, either the thing is working or it isn't, and if it isn't, I don't know what to do, I call the AAA and that's it. Now, when I started working with search, I had exactly the same sort of attitude. And things have changed a little bit, and that's part of this sort of uh, journey that I wanted to discuss with you, assuming that you are not all search specialists or search analysts or search um, geeks. But if you are, you know, you can just hear the story for the fun of it, or you can just decide to go. So, the thing is, search engines, 
in first approximation are just like grump librarians, right? They, they, have to <laughs> they have to have loads of documents that a pest user might want to see. And they, they, need to know, they need to know the contents of all those documents to give the pest user the appropriate document. They, they need to do that in such a way that they can aggregate all the contents of these documents in, such, in, in some sort of big, huge index that they will kind of have to search through all the time. And when the user kind of comes and asks for the document, the librarian has to consult its index, decide what are the most appropriate answers, kind of in the search engines you call the hits. You have to find those guy, these guys in whatever copies, or whatever crawl files you have stored away. And you have to deliver them in a timely and pleasant manner, if you can. And, you know, my librarian is just very grumpy, but actually my librarian is a, um, it's part of um, a collection of blogs of librarians, really, because those guys are my heroes in, in some ways. So, you know, they, they take the mickey out of themselves. They, they make jokes about themselves. Um, so, you, as you can see, they make lots of jokes about themselves. So as you can see that in first approximation, we have this huge, you have this metaphor that it is a way of starting thinking about the subject. You have a building up step where you collect and, in, and index all your documents, that is the web. And there is a serving up process where you kind of, you read the, your query in, you massage it a little bit as much as you want it. You find the results in your huge collection of in your corpora you rank the results, kind of, and you serve the results. And as people say, this is all has to be done very fast. You don't, people are not prepared to wait for things to load, for things to happen in, in a long time. They, it's got to be fast. And these steps correspond to the modules of search engines as far as I'm concerned. So you have a crawler, you have an indexer, you have a query analyzer, you have finding and ranking algorithms, and then you have an awful lot of web server magic. Um, sorry. But of course my metaphor can go, only go so far, right? I can't take it too far away because of course books don't arrive in a library in tens of thousands every day. And search engines do ha have to crawl the web all the time and freshness is a real problem for all search engines. Libraries do not get rid of books. They, they do not have to clean up their index all the time. But search engines would re-index, you know, every five minutes, every minute, every 30 seconds. As, you know, they would re-index as much as they could, really. And libraries, kind of, for libraries it's very easy, right? They just have to hand in their goods, you know. They found whatever they think you need. They just kind of give it to you. But search engines will differentiate themselves terribly much by how they deliver their goods. So that's a, a huge um, discriminating factor between search engines. So, um, so I, I'm just repeating myself here about what are the modules of the search engine. And I, I wanted to, to mention that, you know, these things are very, very trivial, very first approximations and I, I kind of could go over a little bit more and should perhaps go over a little bit more on, on, on things like query analyzing because you, you, you kind of, the way we, we interact with search engines nowadays, we actually forget how much they do for you on, on, on that step, right? You know, everyone expects kind of um, your spelling to be corrected we, we expect, uh, expect to put a, a flight number and to get what is the flight, where it comes from and where it's going to. You expect to say, um, kind of to get telephone numbers, patent numbers. There's a sorts of, an awful lot of extra services that have been slowly being um, um, added to search engines. And of course, you know, we are users. We want these features. You know, we kind of start getting used to them. And 
the, the thing that happens as well is that you know, people start kind of wanting an awful lot of services, different services from their web server. So people want to have things in different languages, they want to have results that are localized, that you know, if, if you're saying something in English and you're saying something in French, you want different sets of res results because even because you expect to be in different places. Even if you are saying things in English, but you are in Canada, you want different look up, different results than the ones that you get in Australia. There's a series of, of things that we have come to expect from search engines. And so, you know, they are not kind of that basic anymore. And everything that I'm saying here is perfectly safe. I'm not saying anything wrong because it's all kind of published and, and obvious in places, kind of very exciting places to read, like um, the ACM produced a, a Q special issue in 2004 about search engines, and Anna Patterson kind of wrote this, this paper, Why Writing Your Own Search Engine is Hard, and Caffarella and Cutting produced this Building Nudge open source search engine. And more recently, Monica Hesinger kind of in science kind of came up with search technologies for the internet. Kind of similar sorts of, of thoughts that I'm kind of distilling here. Simply about the problems that one has and what are the genetics of search engines. And so far, oops. So you know, a person like me who likes kind of little diagrams can start making little drawings like that. And they are all very simple-minded, right? I mean, in my previous slide, I think I did omit this part of, so you, you have an awful lot of documents, your data on the web. You have to crawl it and kind of store it, store it somehow in a clever way. And you kind of then go and mine all this, this data that you, that you swallowed. Uh, as cleverly as you can, and you use this mining uh, steps and, and the scrolling uh, data to do your indexing. <laughs> and that's the bit that kind of happens offline. And then there's the other big thing that happens online, which is that, you know, then your, you, your, your web, but your users come and ask you questions, and there can be an awful lot of users and an awful lot of questions. And then you have to produce these results. You, can, you have to look at your query, decide what you want to do with that, and, and produce results that you then rank oh, kind of at runtime and return, kind of go back to the users. And you know, as I was saying, it's all very trivial, all very um, abstract, because that's what I kind of used to do for a living, abstract mathematics. But there are three words down here that, that make this whole uh, enterprise extremely difficult. First one is, is that you have to scale this up uh, to gigantic numbers. And to scale this up gigantically, you have to do an awful lot of parallelism. It's parallelism in the steroids. And as I was saying, everything is time dependent. So you have huge number of documents, huge numbers of files, and you have to do a huge number of, of searching and finding and, and ranking and everything, and you have to do it in a very short while. But so far, so good, because, you know, as someone who comes from a research background, you just look at that and say, oh, it's okay. I can just go and try to um, understand these bits and put them together. But, But then, you know, how you're going to do it, you're going to do it in a totally different environment than the one that I think most people here are used to, or most people in academia or in, in research world are used to. So that's where I think my metaphor of, of going into Wonderland kind of comes into play. So now we're going to follow our rabbit into a hole and things began to change considerably. So how do we get there? Well, in some ways it's very easy. This is park in 333 Coyote Hill Road, 
and that's where Ku is kind of in 6-6 six, six willow place. So the distance, the geographical distance is not that big, kind of 15 minutes by car. But if park is already a big change from people coming from academia, the difference between park and, and cool is quite big in terms of, of how you feel about your work. So let's go over it slightly slower. Um, when you go from academia to an industrial research place like Park, you have to start uh, not telling your friends about your research. It's kind of hard, you know, you've done that for many, you, you keep telling people about what you do all the time and then you have to stop doing it. And timing for publishing is, is, is an art. You cannot publish too early because IP has to be protected, but if you wait too much, there's nothing to publish. Same thing about um, invention proposals, right? You, you can't really kind of go and make an invention proposal of everything, every single stupid idea that you had in the shower this morning. But on the other hand, if you don't do it soon enough, then other people will either publish or do it and you don't have your invention proposal. So the thing that I hadn't realized was that Park is still much closer to academia than a place like Cool. It is research still. It must become a product, and that's one of the things that people here keep telling us, or keep telling you, but it isn't one to begin with. Whereas a place like Cool, you know, you start with a product. That's your, that's your state zero. And, and even the landscape is kind of different. So over here, you have lots of lovely offices with books and stuff like that. Whereas in startups, you normally have an open plan with individual desks and machines. Um, you have no bookshelves, no individual work phones. Kind of if, if your phone rings, you're disturbing everyone else. So you, know, you better kind of have it in the silent mode like we just did. Um, in Park, if I remember correctly, even if it's still the case, you have four all hands a year, more or less, one each quarter or thereabouts. Well, in Cool, we have one every week, sometimes more than one. And we release new code quite a lot. You know, we release once a week at least, but usually much more. So life moves fast, very fast. And you might be asking yourself, how did you go for that? What is the reason for these things? And, and that's what I kind of wanted to go over uh, right now. So I did get to cool because the founders, Anna Patterson and Tom Costello, are friends of mine from many years ago. They actually also, you know, they don't want to say this to people, but they actually both started life as logicians too. You know, they did PhDs in logic in Stanford and in different kinds of logics. And, but, but they moved out much early on. So they did a, a, a search, a first, their first search startup, which was called Zift in 1999. And, and then Anna kind of designed, wrote, and sold Recall, which I do not know if people here know about it, but uh, Recall is, well, was and still is the kind of the basis of the search engine that powers the Internet Archive, the Wayback Machine. So she, she did this, this work in 2004 and sold this search engine to Google, which, uh, and then she became a person working in Google too, and, apparent, and then she, apparently she was the architect of Google's Terra Google in early 2006. And this business I don't know much because, well, we never talked much about that. And Tom, he worked on IBM and on Web Fountain and then in storage systems uh, worldwide. So together they decided that they actually wanted to do another search engine. And that's how Cool came about. So what are the reasons for Cool? Why do we kind of think that it's an important thing to have another search engine? There are many search engines out there. And in some ways, their results tend to be very similar. So are we saying everything that there is there on the internet? Um, 
no one thinks so, right? There are kind of a series of reports that estimate that we can only see fi around 15% of the existing web and that this thing is decreasing. Now, most of the search engines nowadays kind of use popularity basic ways of finding things. So you see or you're likely to see what others have seen before and you're seeing that thing kind of increases the popularity of you already saw, so which reduces the pool of available stuff in the long run. So that's why this thing is decreasing. This is kind of clearly, at least to me, it's clearly um, feedback negative sort of loop. And you, know, you end up with the impression that you're seeing everything that you're supposed to see. But people are curious, so lots of people want to see what else there is, right? And that, this, this sort of argument that there are other things to be seen in the web, this argument goes on even without uh, ideas of the deep web, which I don't know if you guys know about the deep web. I didn't a year ago, but it's just this idea that, um, that lots of information on the web are, is, is sitting in databases, which you can only uh, have access if you actually fill in a form so if you go, for, ins for instance, to the, genealogy, the, the mathematical genealogy, which is a big site paid by NSF, um, you can see who my uh, mathematical antecedents, uh, ancestors are up to Leibniz and, and, and thereabouts. So you know, it's kind of very nice. You can see all these guys that had PhDs. So my supervisor is my father academically, and my father's father is Robin Gandhi, and my grandfather is actually Alan Turing, which makes me very special because Alan Turing only had one descendant. So, you know, it's kind of, it's one of the things that when you kind of visualize, you actually lose it completely because Alan Turing, well, the guy was special, right? But he only had one uh, PhD student. So when you look at the graph and you're not careful, his bit of the graph just disappears. So, you know, if you want to see this stuff as a human being, you just type it on, your, uh, on that, that database and, and the form is filled and the pages come up showing that kind of information. But if you don't type it, then you don't find it. And to begin with, uh, search engines couldn't uh, fill, do this filling up of forms. And nowadays, apparently, some of it can be done. I don't know exactly how much or, or how little. But, but that's what people call the deep web, which I don't know about you, but I, I find it a very you know, funny name. You know? I think it's trying to remind you of dark matter and stuff like that. But it's not clear that it is as deep as that. Now, another reason for cool, so sorry, back to the back to this stuff here. I think you know, this argument is a very trivial argument, but it convinces me at least that things are getting, uh, that if you don't put some sort of break on this feedback loop, you actually will only see things that people are already seeing and that, you know, that, that, should, that one should be uh, attempting to counteract this, this loop. But what people normally say when confronted with this argument is that actually, okay, there is an awful lot of the web that we don't see. There's an awful lot there that no one can get their hands on, but most of it or all of it is just rubbish. Spam, porn, mindless duplication of known content. And we all see these things, well, I don't know about you, but you know, if you search kind of for funny things, you, you see all this kind of rubbish coming up very quickly. Um, in, in, in ways that can be surprising. So for instance, um, very recently there was a blog post by Matt Cutts, who is a, a, a kind of a guy in Google that's very clever and very good at writing about that. And he, was, he came up with this thing saying, well, I don't know if everyone, of, all of you kind of know about it, but sp spelling checking is one of our main tools against spammers. Because spammers kind of produce, <laughs> yeah, it sounds slightly, um, nonsensical, right? It sounds a little bit like, like Alice in the Wonderland, but the fact is that if you don't correct the spelling, then the spammers kind of can do an awful lot of automatic 
variations on kind of popular queries. So, you know, all the possible misspellings of Britney Spears will bring you an awful lot of spam. So, you know, one of the ways of getting rid of spam is actually improving your spelling correction. But so, you know, that, that's the fact that this, there is this mindless duplication of non-content, that's the mindless duplication of spam and, and porno, pornography. It's, it's, it's terrible, but it's part of the web as it is. Now, one of the reasons for going for something like cool is that even if it is true that lots of this big amount of stuff here is junk, you know, we don't want to throw away the good things together with the junk, right? We want to find information that is important, or people want to find information that's important to them, even when that information is not popular. And as I was saying, my way of kind of doing this as a bit of a chat, as a, as a little bit of conversation over, over a pint of beer or, or over a cup of coffee, is that it's kind of telling you stories. So one of the first things that we had in Cool that was very interesting and different was that we had someone searching for their own name, so a vanity search, and actually finding a long lost brother. And you know, the guy wrote about that, and I said, well, this just looks like crazy. That can't be, the t can't be true. But actually, I went and checked, and it was the case that this guy had a, you know, parents separated, one, one, they were kind of, one was a baby and the other one was 15 years old or something like that, moved away, had a very specific name, a very different name, and, and we found, <laughs> we found the, the guy with a very s difficult name, we found a, a totally silly um, record of the, of the younger brother playing lacrosse somewhere in the Middle West. So the guy really found his brother and, and had a, a good time. So, you know, there is, there is information that is kind of lost in the middle of the junk. And it would be nice to get this information that's lost in the middle of the junk. Now, another kind of, for me at least, very important reason why someone should be doing something like cool is cost and natural resources. Cost and natural resources do matter. And of course, people don't normally pay for the costs of their searches, right? They don't pay that, we don't pay directly. So if you, kind of, if you need to do 15 searches to find whatever you're looking for, or you need to do one, it's kind of the same. You know, it costs you time, so it costs you something. But there's no money kind of directly on that. But there is an awful lot of, of costs to the environment on the big server farms, and this cost to the environment should be part of, of the equation. So one of the things that we think Cool is an interesting idea is that Cool can serve a much bigger index using a, a small fraction of the number of machines. And that's got to be, well, that's cheaper for the environment and cheaper for the company, of course. And, and that's why now we have Alice being very, very small with the big dog there. One more reason for cool. Um, cool doesn't need to know your search history and habits. So we don't keep names, we don't keep IP addresses, and we keep no cookies. So as we say in the front page, your search history is your business, not ours. So the, the, the thing that's kind of um, interesting about that is that we are not kind of worrying about privacy after the event. We're not kind of saying, okay, we don't want to keep your data for 18 months or we'll keep your data for 18 months and then we're going to, to take it away or, or to de delete it or anything like that. We're just not getting it to begin with. And, and hence, you know, it's easier. We don't have it. We don't have to get, uh, we don't have to destroy it after the event. But, so that's the positive side. But what's the negative side? Well, the negative side, well, it's not the negative side for, for, a, play, for, a, for a search engine like Cool, but the negative side of the fact that, that lots of people do keep information about everyone here 
it, it's kind of a, it's a double one, right? Which the, the cartoon is trying to say, because you know, in certain places you are kind of actually very worried about the government keeping your data. In other places, you are very worried about who the other people who are not the government keeping your data. So, you know, one way or the other, and, and Park is one of the places where privacy concerns and pri privacy research has been kind of important because once this thing is done, there's no way back. You, you can't go back. Once your data is out there, there's no coming back. So, last reason for cool, which is the, the most, the, the easiest one to, to talk about, the easiest one that you, you guys can, the guys that have their computers here can play with and the guys, you, you, everyone can look at it at their leisure. There is too much information on the web and what cool is trying to do is to organize the web so that you can find information that, well, sometimes information that you really want, but sometimes information that you even did not know you wanted. So example, in this case, and that's an example of a friend of a friend who was worried about melanoma because of someone else in the family. And according to, to her, she actually went and looked at 20 pages of Google and never found anything about a melanoma vaccine, which of course she would find immediately if she said, if she had typed melanoma vaccine on the search box there. But in cool, she found it immediately on one of these tabs, one of these attempts at separating searches into different domains. We, we do try to do this very hard stuff with images. We think that images can help. And we think that longer snippets help too. And you, you know, and tabs and categories show new stuff, even for people who actually know about it. So, I mean, I don't know how many people here are fond of Jane Austen. I am. <laughs> And, you know, I thought I knew all the Jane Austen novels, so I kind of typed that just for, for fun. And did you know that Jane Austen has one, two, three, four novels that are incomplete? Actually, the first one, I, I, I did not know any of this before, but Lady Susan is actually complete but was not published during her lifetime, and the other ones are incomplete and hence being completed by other people. And, you know, I, and I thought I knew something about it. But kind of carrying on with this theme, we, we get kind of definitions which, you know, when they work, make it easier than going to a dictionary. Timelines, which show the evolution of your concept. So in the Jane, the Jane Austen uh, slide before, I think I, I didn't I crop it up, so you, you can't see that there is a timeline over here for Jane Austen without the novels. Um, and, and there's also this idea of map lines, which kind of, all of them bring new connections. And there's videos and maps and stuff like that. But this one I think is, is kind of cute too, because it's from last week. Last week we kind of got, I got a message from someone in India, because they were very excited about solar eclipses. We had one of the biggest solar eclipses ever, right? Six minutes of solar eclipse. So he kind of, went and looked at it in cool and said, oh, thank you, it was great, I've, I found so many interesting things. So I kind of went and I said, oh, we're going to find bugs on map lines because map lines are kind of recent. We just launched them a month ago. And I kind of looked and said, well, United Kingdom, you know, there's no eclipse. And then I found this bit of information here, which I think is quite incredible. So there were no total solar eclipses visible in the United Kingdom between 1724 and 1925. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I do not know how, uh, how, I mean, with everything in the web, you've got to be careful because you have to go and check that these things really are true. But it sounds quite interesting and great fun to try to see the things. So I finally got to my adventures and, and I'm kind of running late instead of <laughs> running short. So. Uh, I wanted to talk about three different adventures. I wanted to talk about launch and blogosphere. I want to talk about timelines and I want to talk about languages. And I do think I'm going to uh, accelerate a bit. So launch was very different from anything I've ever done before. 
We launched, as I was saying, on the 28th of July, and it was less than three months from the time that I started there. So uh, as you can expect, I did not know much what was going on. But even not knowing much of what was going on, it was very uh, exciting to see things coming out live. We also have the funny thing that, you know, people in New Zealand wanted to kind of say that things were out and about before they were, really. And you can see a picture of, there was a countdown, and one of our friends was kind of writing down, six minutes to launch, 59 minutes to launch, 45 minutes to launch, was very moving in such a way. We had hoped for a soft launch in the middle of the summer, a bit like I was hoping for a very empty seminar today. And we actually end up with an extremely big flood of interest. And, you know, I think that the theories that we try to say that we talk to 10 people thinking that perhaps one or two would kind of report on that, and all of them reported, and each one of them kind of contacted another 10. So, you know, we had huge amount of interest. And there was problems, kind of machines failed, things happened. Um, and personally, because as I was saying, this is all about how I see this stuff, I, I kind of learned an awful lot from this sort of, uh, from launch too, because I hadn't realized how much the Valley runs on the blogs. I did not know anything about tech celebrities. I did not know that they say, I mean, I thought celebrities were kind of people who lived in Hollywood and stuff like that. And I had no, man, no idea of people who make a living doing search en engine optimization. And I found it really unbelievable <laughs> that people went through the trouble of faking bad results. You know, There were enough bad results without them faking them, but they went through the trouble of faking them. So that was adventure number one. And as I was saying, it was kind of a bit like the tier of pools in, in Alice, kind of different and I don't know we kind of we picked ourselves up and said okay let's kind of improve this stuff and in March 09 we kind of came up with the timelines which I think is one of the nicest features of cool because you have this dynamic timelines that are not pre-computed for a few subjects and if the whole project was completed in less than six weeks with a very small team and and of course there are too many timelines. Well, the algorithm still needs improvement. But you know, this is software. This is software out there. You know, the software always needs improvement. There's always bu bugs. There's always things that you need to do. And for me personally, it was a big, a big win because, well, because as some of you know, as I, as I mentioned a minute ago, the husband went to, to to power set and I went to cool. So the situation at home became a little bit complicated because you couldn't talk much about what you're doing at work, right? So it was, as one of my friends was kind of wanted to say, it was a little bit like Mr. and Miss Smith. You know, you can't, you, you kind of keep looking your back and stuff like that and you don't let go of, don't let anyone know of anything that's happening anywhere. And the kids were very happy to begin with because they said, oh, good. Now mom and daddy cannot talk about work, they can talk to us. <laughs> but, but then they realized that the situation wasn't so, so cool. People kind of got a little bit, some, some edges came in. And for me it was a, a huge battle because so far the kids insisted in doing their homework using PowerSet. Right, and when the timelines came around, and people needed a timeline for Anna Boleyn, Anna Boleyn, I kind of was the first time that cool started being used big time, and you know, for lots of things along the lines of timelines, it became, you know, so a household now has people who use cool, people who use PowerSet, but people who use Bing, you know, all sorts of things. Now this third kind of adventure, no, yeah, the third and the last one, because I, I really need to give you time to ask questions, um, is multiple languages. This is another thing that I did not know we could do, and we actually launched in May or nine, and there was an awful lot of infrastructure in place. We worked, I worked in Park in natural language for a long, long time, and everything kind of was complicated and difficult because we wanted to do things perfectly here, right? And in a startup, you're not worried about perfect. You just do it, you know. 
And, and you do quite a bit of it. If you do 70% of it, then, then you're good. And as I say, all of this with a team of around 20 technical people or thereabouts. So to me, it's quite, um, quite surprising. And, 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 and that's the this, this thing that kind of makes you feel like going back to work every day. Now, I really would like to talk lots about opportunities. And some of them are generic. Everyone has the same problems, quality of evaluation, needs to improve relevance, and as I was saying, more services, because everyone always wants more services. You want, people want uh, cool mail, people want all sorts of new things, they want uh, thumbnails of, of pages, they want, they want way back machines inside cool, they want all sorts of interesting stuff. And what I really want to do more work on, you know, if, if that was a, a research talk, would be the future, future work section, is in the three banes of my life, that is spam, 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 malware, and the worst one of them, attacking pornography. Because I'm not a prude, I don't have anything against people wanting to have their pornography and stuff, that it's between them and their computers, that's fine. What I have a problem with is when it attacks us that are not trying to see it, you know, and there's an awful lot of that about. So that's why, you know, I have to move out of Alice in the Wonderland and put Macbeth witches, witches there, because these things are serious. But summing up, and just in time, life in Switzerland is very different and lots of fun. And I reckon that Anna is very right when she said, well, when she wrote on that same paper, that once the search bug gets you, you will be back, a bit like the governator. The problem isn't getting any easier, and it needs all the experience anyone can master. So I think lots of people will be joining us on this enterprise. And I think that's it. Thank you. I'll leave with Lewis Carroll poem. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>